speak through Fox News and let um, the independents who are tuning into you, let them know what it is that she stands for, the principles behind her positions. It used to be that new candidates were advised to brush up on the issues so they could handle questions from anyone, even tough questions. The idea behind that was that it prepared you also for actually governing. But now the advice to candidates is only to talk to sympathetic reporters. We need to start now by electing strong leaders who aren't afraid to shake it up. We need strong, principled leaders, public servants who respect our Constitution. We need clarity. We deserve answers. So we don't ask the same questions tomorrow. Good night, Lord. Second Freedom Day, and we take it back for the little guy. Because, you know, we don't ask for much. We ask for a good job in our own hometown so that we can secure ourselves and secure our families. We ask for a fiscally and a physically secure union. And we ask for an honest government that is on our side and won't be riding our back. We ask for leaders with servants' hearts and ears to hear what the people are asking them to do for us. And we're not asking for much from them. We're asking for leaders who won't mortgage our kids' future with trillions more in debt. And leaders who understand that raising federal taxes in a time of economic woe is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for bankruptcy of our country. Ultimately, causing the people to rely on a centralized government, a big government to provide for them. The president admits this is now about compromise. And he may give in. Democrats, some do say, cave in to Republican demands to extend the tax cuts to the wealthy. All this after the Senate failed to extend those tax cuts for just the middle class. And I'll admit, I am very disappointed that the Senate did not pass legislation that had already passed the House of Representatives to make middle class tax cuts permanent. But that legislation never had a chance, despite Democrats trying to shame Republicans. We're passing a tax cut for every person in America. They're demanding that the wealthiest Americans get a tax cut that is 1,000 times the size of the average American. Democrats tried to make permanent the tax cuts for those making less than 250000 a year. Mr. Barrasso. No. Then raise the tax breaks to anyone making up to a million dollars a year. Mr. Alexander, no. The deadline is looming. The tax cuts expire at the end of the month. Now, I don't know what uh, my colleagues across the aisle uh, didn't hear uh, during the election. You know, American people spoke pretty loudly. They said, stop all the looming tax hikes uh, and to cut spending. Obviously, that wasn't on the Situation Room. That was a press conference. Stepping on, uh, stopping the tax hikes, even for the wealthy. That's what they're saying. Democrats are calling statements like that and Senator McConnell's letter today a slap in the face or an opening position in a tough negotiation. Republicans are saying they're listening to the American people and the priority should be on the economy. You can decide for yourself which side you believe or support. But keep in mind, some of the claims being made about popular support for extending the Bush tax cuts, even for the wealthy, aren't necessarily supported by the polling data. No tax increases for nobody. You know, American people spoke pretty loudly. The American people spoke in deafening terms. The American people spoke loudly and clearly. The American people spoke on election night. The message I heard this last election cycle was, uh, we don't want anybody's taxes going up. Americans don't think we should be raising taxes on anybody. And we ask for leaders who understand that raising federal taxes in a time of economic woe is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe to bankrupt our country. We should prevent a huge tax increase. Keep tax rates where they are. No tax increases for any American. The message they sent was stop the tax hikes. And we heard them. According to a Gallup poll uh, last week, about 80 well, 80% of the American people do not want to see taxes raised. Well, that's Senator John Kyle of Arizona saying that 80% of the American people do not want to see taxes rise. In fact, it's not exactly true. According to that very poll he cited, the Gallup poll, just 40% of Americans want to keep all tax cuts for all incomes. 44% want to keep tax cuts but set limits for wealthy Americans. And 13% want the tax wants the cuts to expire for all Americans. Plus, a vote in the House to let taxes go up on all earnings above 250 grand. 
but not before the Republican leader calls it chicken crap. Democrats in the House looking to extend some of the tax cuts over strong objections. I can't imagine that my colleagues on the Republican side don't want to give a tax cut to the middle class. This is a purely political exercise. The whole fight that D.C. is having right now is over what's going to happen to the Bush tax cuts, right? That was the basis for the letter that the Republicans sent today. We will filibuster everything until the tax cuts are dealt with. Even though we already filibuster everything anyway, we melodramatically threaten to filibuster again until we get what we want for rich people's tax cuts. The thing that Republicans want on the tax cuts should theoretically give Democrats even more leverage over them than they already have. They are willing to risk everything in order to get a bonus round of tax cuts for millionaires and billionaires. They are literally willing to, to stop everything, risk everything in the economy in order to get an extra tax cut. We don't care if it's paid for, doesn't matter if it's paid for, doesn't matter if anything else gets done, doesn't matter national security. We're not going to take up the START tree. We don't care about our relationship with Russia. We don't care about uh, national security issues. We want a tax cut for our friends. Millionaires, billionaires, adding $700 billion to the debt. This is not partisanship. This is about common sense and what works. We have had a policy in place that has not worked. So why would we continue it? It's very clear what this is about. $700 billion not paid for, going on the national debt. A policy, is, as you uh, pointed out in my comments earlier, that doesn't work, hasn't worked. You know, they've had this policy in place of extra tax cuts for 10 years, and I just want to know where are the jobs. <laughs> And Freedom Day, and we take it back for the little guy. Because, you know, we don't ask for much. We ask for a good job in our own hometown so that we can secure ourselves and secure our families. We ask for a fiscally and a physically secure union, and we ask for an honest government that is on our side and won't be riding our back. We ask for leaders with servants' hearts and ears to hear what the people are asking them to do for us. And we're not asking for much from them. We're asking for leaders who won't mortgage our kids' future with trillions more in debt, and leaders who understand that Raising federal taxes in a time of economic woe is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for bankruptcy of our country, ultimately causing the people to rely on a centralized government, a big government to provide for them. She's extra sassy these mm, days, too, because yeah, she's yeah. winning. All her mama grizzlies are winning. <laughs> and they're busting through, busting through that glass ceiling. <laughs> They're going to Washington, and they're going to flip your picnic table, Dave. <laughs> you know what I noticed on Fox News last night, though, is on Fox News, they address her as Governor Palin, which is like calling me Dairy Queen employee. <laughs> like, I was once, but I quit. That's right. <laughs> okay. There is that point there that uh, somehow Sarah Palin forgets. Oh, well. Uh, I'll only bring it up because you guys brought it up. Is, the, is, is Sarah Palin important in this race? Obviously, Joe Miller is her candidate of choice. Do you think I, think it, I think it hurts him more than it helps him. I mean, you know, she, she does have really low numbers. And people that did support her and, and walked door to door in the snow. I mean, you think it's cold now? You, you wait a month. People walked uh, door to door for her to get her elected, and she quit. And there's a lot of things you can do in Alaska, but you can't quit. You can't run dogs and quit. You can't row a boat and quit. You won't survive here if you're a quitter. It's our fifth and the last one. So, so she, even, even people that are still conservative, st still they see her as a quitter. Perhaps we are not properly educating our youth in the exceptional nature of America. 
It's worrisome because this belief in American exceptionalism is something that every new generation has got to make its own if we expect our republic and our liberties to be secure and to live on. For America to survive, we have got to pass this on to that next generation, to the young kids who are here, to the students. You know, this real America, does it exist, John? Well, in terms of real American and exceptionalism, look, the most basic thing that people can do in support of a democracy is vote. And we take our votes very seriously. The people of Alaska voted for Sarah Palin, and Sarah Palin quit. Exceptional people don't quit. And I, I seriously tell my kids this probably two or three times a week. It's better to lose than to quit. So she can sit there and she can talk about being exceptional. She can talk about better of America. If she were a better person, she would have stood and fought. She chose to check out and to do it to make money. I've got no problem with making money. But that's what she is. She's a reality. I, I have a different observation, though. He, he hears what's going on. That speech, the first 20 minutes, was every vapid cliche strung together. It, it, it was complete, almost nonsense. Suppose Senator John Doe puts forth a constitutional amendment that would outlaw abortion, even in cases of rape or incest, and he asked you to attend the announcement and support him in that. Would you do it? Um, I would. I would. Yes, um, uh, a proposal like that, I would stand by it. Let's be completely clear about the facts here. There is no place in the world and no time in history where restricting women's reproductive rights makes a people or a nation more free or more equal. These extreme positions on abortion are without any question a war on American girls and women and the fact that there are women who are both complicit and participatory in it is really neither surprising nor unprecedented. It has always been true and it is incredibly important that we recognize that despite the fact that we can be very proud of these women as women and as politicians, that the question is how do women as citizens fare on the other side of them either being elected or not elected.